Good morning. As we go through stuffy noses and uh, a lot of Kleenex, I'm sure, across the church, I hope that you all have come prepared this morning. Uh, As we continue to go through our Messianic Psalms up until Christmas, uh, I'm going to be in Psalm 31. And just to kind of give you an introduction to the Messianic Psalms and what they are, maybe you've never heard of that before, but the Messianic Psalms are Psalms that that just relate back to Christ. They talk about him hundreds of years beforehand. Sometimes they they say things about his attributes, what he's going to be, who he is. And the one that we're looking at today, uh, Jesus said, you know, in the the last time of his ministry, as he hung on the cross. Uh, And so this is a psalm that I I enjoyed as as I've I've never done anything with the Messianic Psalms. So Rick and I were kind of talking about what what I was going to be doing today, and he was telling me what I was going to preach on or showing me a video about what I was going to preach on. And uh, we were just talking about the Messianic Psalms, and this one came to to my mind in my research. So I I hope you enjoy uh, our our series and our our study through these Psalms, and and especially this uh, this one today. So... If you will, open your Bibles. We'll be in Psalm 31. We're going to do 1 through 8. Then we'll look at the last little bit uh, in Psalm 31 as well. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction and you know the distresses of my soul. You have not delivered me into into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, we love you, and Lord, I thank you for uh, these psalms that point to the coming uh, of the Messiah, Lord. As we look to Christmas and we look to to whenever you first came, God, I thank you for these psalms that point to you. And Lord, I I pray that each and every one of us will look to you, not only today, but each and every day throughout their lives, God. Whatever may be burdening their heart, they will just turn it over to you. So in your holy and most precious name we pray, amen. So today, as we, as we go through this, uh, many of us have problems. Many of us have baggage. Just somebody look at somebody next to you and say, look, I have problems. Maybe you are sitting next to your biggest problem in your life. I don't, wanna, I don't want anybody to raise hands on that one, but maybe you're sitting next to your biggest problem. Maybe your biggest problem just got sent away to children's church, or maybe your biggest problem is over in the nursery right now, whichever. But we all have problems. And what the people, a lot of people term this as, what I'm kind of going to call it today, is just we have baggage. We have a lot of baggage. Uh, Whenever we go to Nicaragua, we take a lot of baggage with us. A lot of gifts, a lot of clothes, a lot of tubs that people, you provide for us. We take a lot of baggage. We get a lot of funny looks in the airport whenever we go to Nicaragua because we have stacks of those big blue tubs. We're just pushing around carts, and the, the airport people are helping us push it through. We have a ton of baggage, and we get a lot of looks. And whenever we go to Nicaragua, it's always another extra hour in the airport because they have to cut all the zip ties and look through them and check them out. And so each and every one of us have problems or baggage. And Daniel had these same problems and baggage. Daniel's the one writing these psalms. I'm just going to kind of list out some of his problems or his baggage that he had. And, And just to name a few, he had family problems. He had some family baggage. Many of you may have family problems or family baggage today. Daniel, as soon as he gets kind of appointed to be the king, the next king over Israel, his family kind of turns against him. And eventually we read later in life that Daniel's family hated him. Like his brothers, his, his siblings who he grew up with hated him. They didn't even want to be associated with him. So Daniel had a few family problems. Daniel also had a problem called women. Uh, I don't know of any men in here who may have problems with women, Uh, maybe even before you're married, maybe even currently while you are married. I'm not going to go into that. But Daniel had problems with women, a.k.a. Bathsheba. Um, She was a big, big problem for him that led him to that. He also had a couple of problems with rebellion. During his ministry, not his ministry, during his reign as king, 
He had rebellion throughout the time that he was there. And the one person that kind of culminates or, or sums up all three of those problems is a guy by the name of Absalom. Absalom was one of his sons from one of his many wives. And Absalom created a ton of problems for him. One of my favorite stories to tell people who don't know a lot about church as I talk to them, and they're like, I can't come to church because I've got too many problems. I have no clue what's going on. My life just isn't right, this, that, and the other. I'm supposed to be this way before I can come to church. I'm supposed to be this way because the Bible, I mean, all it talks about is being good and never talks about anything about being bad. And I point to Absalom, and I point to the story of David, and I'm like, you have no clue. David was called a man after God's own heart. Check out his son, and this is what his son did. And his son even pitched a tent up In his kingdom, at the highest place, he pitched a tent for all of David's concubines or women to come in. And Absalom laid with all of these women. So if you don't think you have problems, look to Absalom, look to David. They had some problems and some baggage. We also see in these messianic psalms, we see David's problems. He just lays them out there for us. This one was written during one of the rebellions that he had, while his city was under siege, like we read later on. We also see the raw emotions of David. David was an emotional guy. He, didn't, he wasn't scared to write to God and show these things to him. He had some raw emotions that he showed him. And so as I'm doing my research for this, I look and, and I, I try to research, okay, what's some, what's some common emotions that people have? And here are the top, not top, these are the basic emotions that pretty much everybody lists out. And I find it interesting the way that they list them. The, the first emotion that is almost on every single list of the basic emotions for people is fear. And that's interesting because the number one command in the Bible is do not fear. So many times we are crippled by fear. Maybe a decision that we're supposed to make, maybe something that we're supposed to be doing in our lives, and we're just crippled by fear. That's the number one basic emotion on almost every list that I researched as well as the number one command in the Bible, to not fear. And as we, as we go through the rest of these, there's, there's kind of all laid out for us there. There's fear, there's anger, there's sadness, joy. There's finally a happy one, I like joy. Disgust, trust, hope, shock, love, and regrets. Those are the top 10 basic emotional needs for, or not needs, but basic emotions that people express. And everything else kind of comes off as a pinwheel from those things. And as I thought about these emotions, I was like, man, a lot of these are depressing. You know, fear, anger, sadness, disgust, hope. I mean, hope sounds really, really good, but you're probably in a place of fear or disgust in order to hope for something else. And a lot of us just have a lot of regrets. And so as I thought about these things, I also thought about a movie that recently came out this year. It's called Inside Out. There's a a picture of kind of the the characters of Inside Out. Many of your kids are probably laughing because they love this movie. I loved it too, and I'm I'm just a big kid. Um, But this movie, if you don't know what it's about, in the middle, the girl with her hands like, yay. All right, that's Joy. Um, She's kind of the ringleader of these, these people, these emotions, You have anger, the guy with his hair on fire. Uh, He looks pretty angry. Uh, You also have sadness laying on the floor, looking super blue. Uh, You have, I think it's maybe disgust or uh, whatever, the green girl. She's just kind of a teenager. I just call her a teenager. And then you have fear. It's over here. Looks like the little nerdy guy who's scared to do everything. So the the premise of this movie, if you haven't seen it, uh, these emotions go through the journey of a life of a little girl. And, and they have key emotions or key memories is what they call them. And they're like little orbs that just have a key memory, a happy moment for this child. And everything up to this point in the movie, all her memories are joyful. All her memories are happy. She doesn't have a sad memory. And all of a sudden, sadness, the little blue girl laying on the floor, goes and tries to touch one of the orbs and it turns blue. And all of a sudden, this girl, as she's going through her teenage years, is starting to get sad. And she's, her, her key memories are not being happy. So she is changing as a person to start being more sad and more angry and more this and more that. And so the whole movie tries to go around this about how to find her key memories and fix them 
so that she could be happy and be the normal person that she is again. And, and finally, at the end of the movie, they come to this point where they realize that there can be multiple emotions in her life. She can have a happy and a sad moment in, 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 in one memory. She can have anger, but still be fearful because she understands the, the differences between those. And sometimes I think that we as a church, we as pastors, we as people, look at our Christian lives and look at the Bible and say, well, you have to be joyful, and you have to do this. You have to be happy. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to be joyful. And I think we as the church have done a disservice or a wrong to all of you for saying that you have to be happy. I don't, I don't think that you have to be happy. I think that you can be mad with God just like David was. I think you could be scared of what's coming up and that be okay and us not have to say, well, you shouldn't be anxious about anything. I think that we have done a disservice to you as a church for saying that. Because all I see in the Bible is people very emotional about God. And sometimes I think that we as good Christians who have grown up hearing this and hearing about how we should be joyful and we should encourage people and we should do this, this, and this, I think that we have done a disservice to the people that we're right next to every day in life. And we just look at somebody and we say, you know what, Dallas, you're going through a lot of stuff and I really feel like you need to be joyful and you don't need to be this way anymore. I think we have done a disservice to those people that we say that to. I think that we don't need to defend God. God can defend himself. Instead of saying, well, you don't need to do this because God, God's going to have a plan and he's going to work it out for you, let, let him handle that. We just need to comfort the person that's going through the problems and going through the baggage that they're going through at that moment. And then let God worry about the rest from there and just handle the emotions that are there. And so as we go through these things, we see David's problems and we see David's emotions. And I think there's some transitions or some uh, correlations that we have to our own life. And we have our own baggage and we have our own emotions that we're dealing with maybe even today. And so I want to talk about a few of those as we go through. Uh, the first baggage that we talk about or the first problem that we talk about or I'm going to talk about today is known baggage. So if you're taking notes, maybe you want to write down known baggage, known problems. Maybe some of you in here have known problems and the whole world knows them as well. David had some known problems. Nobody needed to ask David, hey David, how's your, how's your marriage doing? Hey David, how's stuff with Bathsheba going? Everybody knew it. Maybe sometimes today you feel like everybody in the world knows the baggage or the problems that you were having. And everywhere that you go, you get those looks. It's like, uh, I wonder what's going on here. Maybe you have some known baggage. And David says it very clearly, like in verse 1. He says, Lord, let me never be put to shame. Let me never be put to shame. I know what people say about me. I know that they know what's going on. I know that they know every little detail because of Facebook and Instagram. David had those, I'm sure. And everything was put out all over the internet. He said, Lord, let me never be put to shame because they know what's going on. I know what's going on, but God, you know even more so what's going on inside of my heart. But David also had hidden baggage. That's the second kind of baggage or problems that David had. He had things that were hidden from other people. Maybe not that everybody could see. Maybe everybody could see the results of them, but not everybody could see his little minute stuff that he was going through. And he says in verse 2, he says, Lord, bow down your ear to me, incline your ear to me. It's almost like he's wanting to whisper to God. He's wanting God to hear him when he prays. And maybe he doesn't want to stand up and shout it from the rooftops and say, God, I'm an adulterer. God, I'm a murderer. He doesn't want to shout those things. He wants to say, God, come here. I need to, I need to kind of tell you a secret. I like those. I like secrets sometimes. Not really, don't tell me your secrets. I'm not a good secret keeper. But he's like he's telling him a secret. So he has hidden stuff that he's trying to keep out of it. And I think today maybe some of us have hidden baggage. I think some of us have little, little pet sins or little pet things we love to run back to, but nobody really knows about it except for us. We do it in the quiet of the night. We do it in the dark. We do it while our 
husband's away working or while our kids are away playing or whatever they're doing. We have some hidden baggage. But I also think that some of us have some hidden problems that maybe we just don't understand about. And some of those problems go by really, really nice names like work or school or money or even love. Those can be hidden problems that all we do is chase after and chase after and chase after. The recognition and work, a raise at work, so we put in more and more hours sacrificing time with our family and with God. We want to be the best at the sports that we can possibly be, so we sacrifice time with family and friends and with God to do the best that we can in some of these areas. And I also think that some of us, maybe today, I have, I have caught myself doing this so many times that, that as I was doing this, I was like, Lord, you, you convict me when I don't even want to be. You, you know the things that are going on in my life. I think that some of us, me, I, have become so good at playing church. Like, you remember whenever you were a kid and you played teacher or you played school and you always had that person that played the teacher and they were always doing, you know, y'all need to sit down, y'all need to do this and you need to do that. I loved playing house or loved playing school whenever I was growing up. And I think that many of us have just translated that into our own life. We have just become really, really good at playing church. And, and we, we show up and we, we have our hearts are, are in the right places but we still have, still have missed the mark. And we still are carrying around the baggage with us. We're carrying around all the tubs going to Nicaragua with us. And we never left that back there. We're still playing church with all of the tubs taking it to Nicaragua. So we see our hidden baggage. God sees our hidden baggage. God sees our known baggage. David had both of those. But ultimately we see later on, that David had hope. David had hope to fix all of these things that were going on in his life. And he says in verse 1, he says, God, I put my trust in you. He says, God, I put my trust in you. So if you have baggage here this morning, you have problems that are going on, number one, you can trust God. God's good at keeping secrets. He doesn't tell anyone. God's good at laying your burdens on him. So you can trust in God. He also says in verse 2 that God is a fortress, a fortress for our defenses. I love the songs that are talking about God as our fortress. He is not a wall that will be built or says that it will be built and somehow somebody's trying to figure out how to pay for it. God's, God's fortress is already built. He is not the Great Wall of China that that can be destroyed by an earthquake. He is not a house or a foundation that can be shaken by hurricanes or tornadoes or whatever. God is a mighty fortress, and in him we can hide, and in him we can trust, and in him we can completely lean on. And then we also see in verses 8, 7 and 8, we see that God knows David. God looks straight at David in his heart. He sees the problems. He sees the baggage and the problems that David continues to carry around in his life. Israel has seen it, but God has seen it clearer. And he still loves David. David says in 7, he says, Lord, you have known me, and you still have not turned away. Isn't that so beautiful this morning, church? That God sees me for who I am as a sinner, as somebody who is not even worthy to call the name of God. He still loves me. He still sent his son to die for me. Someone who has never, never should have happened. Never should have, I'm not worthy for God to do those things for me. And I'm so thankful that he has. And I'm so thankful that he is the fortress that I can turn to. I'm so thankful that he is the ear that listens to me, even whenever I complain about all my problems. Even whenever I complain about, oh, I'm so sad I didn't get to get my meal upsized today. Oh, my fries were so cold. Oh, this sweet tea was terrible. 
And I'm so glad that God listens to me whenever I complain. And I'm so glad that God still loves me for all of those things. He also says that God is our rock. That he is the person who we build our foundation on. He is the solid person. He is not changing. He's not like women whenever they get hormonal and their emotions are bouncing up and down. Or men. Men get hormonal too. I know it, it's weird. But men get hormonal. It's not like our, his emotions bounce up and down. He is so solid and so stable. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so thankful that he is, he is there for me at all times. And I want to end today by reading verses 21 through 24 in Psalm 31. This is the ultimate hope that we have and that David ends his psalm with that I want to look at today. Verse 21, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously, wondrously shown me his steadfast love to me. When I was in a besieged city, I had said in my alarm, now he's screaming this, he's saying in alarm, he's screaming. He says, Lord, I am cut off from your sight. But you have heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. And he continues in 23 and 24. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. So if you are in here this morning and you are waiting for the Lord, I promise you, This is not an empty promise. God has fulfilled it over and over again. God will be there for you. If he is with David who had all the problems and the baggage that David had in his life and that Abraham had and that all the people in the Bible had in their lives, I promise you that you cannot do anything that will separate you from the love of God. That the problems that you have this morning, the problems that you have tomorrow, the problems that you have had throughout your life, and you just can't shake off the addictions or the situations that you continue to find yourself in, none of that is too much for God to handle. He is the rock that we can trust in. He is the fortress that we can run to. Even when we are in a besieged city, a city that's being attacked, just like David, Our lives are under attack from our friends. Our lives are under attack from our husbands, our wives, our children, our co-workers, whoever. God is still there to comfort us and love us through that. So as Jonathan and Tim come, I just want to, they're not here, they're still playing with the children. Um, As they are finishing coming and and playing music with the children for them to sing in the Christmas musical, I just want to pray for you guys. And pray for the problems that you may have. And pray for the family problems that you may have as you move toward Thanksgiving. Where you have, you go and eat with your family. And everybody loves to ask, well, how's school going? Oh, I'm actually just failed out. Thanks for asking again. I just told you for the twelfth time. Well, how is this going? Well, I told you again. This is terrible. Stop asking me about it. As we move toward those things, I want to pray for you. Pray for your family. And pray for your hearts as you turn toward God. Let's pray.